Joining me now on the phone to give us the latest updates on blastocystis is Ken Barum. Uh, Ken is the founder of the Blastocystis Research Foundation. Uh, how are you doing, Ken? I'm doing well. Thanks, Robert. Okay, great. Um, just to start out, can you go ahead and tell my website audience, for those that might not know, what is blastocystis? It is a, uh, a single-cell protozoa. It's uh, transmitted through the fecal oral route through um, ingestion of contaminated food or water. And it's um, okay. the most common uh, organism we see right now in industrialized countries in um, uh, fecal samples of that class. And uh, symptoms of infection um, occur in about, depends on the population, but 50% uh, is a is a good guess. It can range from the low of 10% to a high of 90%. And uh, they include um, diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, fatigue, uh, vomiting, nausea. Yeah, very good. Now, I understand that you presented a paper at the International Parasitology Conference in Mexico City. Can you uh, tell us more about that paper and the research you did? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it was uh, kind of a mathematical paper. Uh, right now we're um, looking at a bunch of studies. Um, I think there are over a thousand studies on it right now. And uh, one of the, you know, difficult things in medicine is to try to figure out, you know, once you've got all this data, you know, exactly what it means. Um, you know, for instance, it means everybody's going to get sick when they're infected. Um, will some people get sick? You know, why, why do some people get sick and not other people get sick? Um, and some of those can be complex questions when you do uh, epidemiological studies. So what we did is took a look at some of the uh, methods um, that researchers use to uh, establish association. And we also looked at what happens when you start including um, other infectious things like Giardia or Cryptosporidium in those studies. And uh, we basically showed that if you've got um, people who've got a whole bunch of different things wrong with them, that you really can't show that blastocystis is associated with infection in that population. And that in order to construct a study, you need to um, essentially exclude patients with um, viral and, and other bacterial diarrhea uh, from the study group. So Ken, if somebody wanted to take a look at this study, where, where, where was it published? Where could they find it? Um, we've got a website. It's um, bhomcenter.org. It's uh, B as in boy, H-O-M-Center.org. And uh, there were uh, actually four very good presentations there, and uh, we're going to try to get uh, the slides from all of those posted on that website. Okay, great. Now, while you were in Mexico City, um, was there any other research that caught your eye uh, concerning blastocystis? Um, yeah, actually, one of the Mexican, you know, because as, as I said, we've got this, this case where, um, uh, you know, some people get sick and some people don't. So, so that's a focus, um, I mean, from an epidemiological standpoint and a, um, you know, health policy standpoint, you know, there's the question of what do you do if, if everybody doesn't get sick? You know, is it the responsibility of the patient in that case, um, or is it still a community responsibility if only, you know, half people get diarrhea? You know, do you say that's, you, well, you, you shouldn't have diarrhea because this other person didn't have diarrhea. So, so they're studying that. And originally they thought it was because there are um, different types of blastocystis. But it turns out in um, studies, we haven't found any strong association between um, symptomatic expression and the type of blastocystis. And there, some, some are probably more likely to cause disease, but it's the case where you know, one might be 30% get sick or another might be 70% get sick. Um, but one Mexican group has found that there's a um, very probably a host genetic trait that occurs in probably maybe 20 to 40 percent of the population um, that is more likely to, um, or, or that population will be more likely to get symptoms uh, when they're infected with blastocystis. Okay. Well, um, let me go back about four years. That's the last time I interviewed you. And we were talking about blastocystis treatments and diagnostics. And at the time, um, you weren't very thrilled with what was available. So I'm, I'm asking you four years later, have things gotten any better? Uh, well, I, th I think that there, the information is more clear now. I, I think there's, I'd say, universal agreement from all the, the researchers that, that none of the treatments were actually eradicating the infection. 
Um, and that's significant because, um, you know, before a doctor would prescribe treatment and then the patient would get better, and the conclusion was, well, it couldn't have been blastocystis. Um, and in some cases, that conclusion was even made without retesting the patient. It was just assumed that, um, you know, every infection had some kind of treatment. Um, but, you know, at least acknowledging that's not the case and that you can't use treatment studies like that to um, establish whether or not it's a cause of illness is important. Um, you know, and I guess they, there are now better diagnostics available um, at the research level. I think everybody is um, aware that you can't just use clinical diagnostics for um, identifying infection, at least within the research community. Um, and then hopefully we'll try to figure out um, how to get those into clinical use in the future. But yeah, from a patient standpoint, I think there's um, there's there's much less. You know, the CDC has updated their webpage. Um, you know, we noted that in the in the conference, they've done a really good job. So I think there's less inclination to um, you know blame patients now for the symptoms. You know, there is acknowledgement that uh, it's not something somebody's making up. You know, especially with all the animal studies we have now. Um, so I think that that at least is an improvement. Oh, very good. That, actually, that's that's pretty significant. Um, so, Ken, um, how you got into blastocystis uh, in the formation of the foundation, as you have a very personal story concerning this, do you mind uh, sharing that story with my audience? Yeah, yeah, sure. We we moved from, um, actually from Boise to, to Oregon in uh, 2000, and I think it was maybe 2002 or 2003, I, I got really sick, um, you know, from this and, uh, you know, went through the whole testing, rubarole, you know, I had no GI symptoms before that. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, I was actually on disability for a few months, uh, you know, just almost unable to get out of bed, um, you know, from fatigue. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, that was the, you know, the general consensus among gastroenterologists in the community. You know, these were board certified people who've all been working here for 20 to 30 years. Um, you know, they've been seeing this. And I know in some cases reporting it, but, um, you know, they couldn't really get any progress to the research community, um, especially in the United States. But, you know, I think around the same time, a lot of other people started coming to the same conclusion. And, um, you know, at that point, research really started taking off. And, uh, and we, we started the first nonprofit group to ever work with researchers to coordinate their efforts and try to share resources. And, uh, you know, hopefully we had a little part in the progress, and hopefully we're still playing a part in that role. Right. And, and as far as the severity of your personal infection, how common is it for people to suffer to that extent? Oh, I'm probably in the worst 5%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, of course, this out of this came the blastocyst a Blastocystis Research Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the foundation and how our reader could learn more about it and visit it? Um, yeah, our, our website's probably the best best resource. Um, we've worked with researchers. We've got about, uh, I think, a dozen peer-reviewed um, articles now. Um, we're, we're a little different in that we do a lot more meta studies and looking at where the research is going. Um, you know, we don't necessarily do lab work. Um, but we, we back up, uh, you know, because there are already many talented people who do that work. But uh, we look a lot about, um, you know, topics like uh, statistical inference, um, uh, you know, who, who can help other people with research, you know, what resources do different groups have, and how do we put teams together, um, you know, to have a range of skills to, to address these things. And, uh, you know, so, so in that sense, you know, many researchers don't necessarily read everything within their field of expertise and, and in some cases they don't even you know very rarely go outside of that field for similar infections. Um, you know, so we, we play a role there to try to get researchers to, to coordinate and also you know work with teams who are doing work in histolytica and the cryptosporidium because um you know the infections have many many things in common. Sure. Um and if I can recall correctly, last time um I interviewed you uh, there wasn't a lot of U.S. research going on at the time. I think I believe you told me a lot of it was happening overseas. Are you seeing that shift at all? <laughs> no, years? no. And I, uh, actually, some of the our researchers here were kind of kidding me, saying, "You know, what's 
what's happening in the U.S. You know, we haven't even got the uh, uh, you know studies on subtype distributions. Um, yeah, yeah, that is that is unfortunate. Um, the research in the U.S. Um, uh, is, is strongly funded um, by the NIH, uh, which is a little different from from other organizations or other countries where it's um, funded by a variety of organizations. And um, you know, b because of that, it, um, it tends to take on a, a very you know monolithic um, nature, where there are a couple of diseases that you know we'll have tons of money thrown at. But um, you know, things like diarrheal diseases in the U.S. really don't get much research at all. Right. And yeah, it's especially true for uh, um, you know. I mean, w one ironic thing is because it's classified as a protozoa and not a vir virus or a bacteria. Is it gets put into a, a separate category uh, for research, which essentially we've, we've abandoned at the federal level. Um, you know, not for reasons of prevalence or epidemiology or anything like that, or cost impact, um, because unfortunately these decisions don't get made based on economic analysis. It's more um, a function of what researchers want to study and and what. At the, at the federal level, what kind of leadership is being provided, and and in the U.S., um, essentially everything has gone to uh, viral and bacterial research. Okay, and I have to I have to imagine that people that are inflicted with blastocystis um, have to be grateful for the work that you guys are doing. Um, if somebody wanted to learn more about the Blastocystis Research Foundation, where could they go? Um, the website's probably the best uh, resource. It's uh, uh, bhomcenter.org. It's uh, b as in boy, h o m c e n t e r dot org. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you spending the time to talk to me about this, Ken. Is there anything else you'd like to add before uh, before we go? No, no. Th you know, thanks for for the opportunity to get, to get the word out, and you know, I just encourage patients to uh, you know stick with it. You know, so there, there are some dietary Changes that um, can help reduce symptoms, and uh, you know, even though if, you know the U.S. is a leader in many ways, but we, we are only five percent of the world population. So I, I think in this case, it'll be uh, you know other countries that will be probably providing the leadership here, which which is okay. You know, we've, we're we're very good at some things, and um, in other things, maybe we can't uh, muster the resources to deal with that. But um, very good. You know, that's a it's a community, and we're looking toward the international community to help out patients. Well, thanks for all the great work you're doing at the Blast to Assistance Research Foundation. Thank you, Ken Borum, and uh, have a great day, sir. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.